welcome to the colloquium. Today we have two speakers from NASA Ames, uh, Ruslan Bielikov and Ed Eduardo Bendek. So Ruslan will speak first and Eduardo will follow him and we'll take the questions at the end. So quickly, Ruslan studied at Princeton and then got his PhD at Stanford. He has been at Ames since and he's the head of the Ames coronagraph experiment and um, Eduardo has studied in Chile and then got his PhD from University of Arizona. He specializes in optics and has worked on multiple telescope telescopes, including VLT in Chile and MMT in Arizona. Uh, and today they're gonna tell us about prospects for imaging a habitable planet around okay. Alpha Centauri. All right, um, so uh, thank you for coming to my talk. And um, I will, uh, and Eduardo, tell you about prospects for imaging a habitable planet at Alpha Centauri with a small space telescope. Uh, you, um, I'm sure um, most of you are aware of all the wonderful discoveries that have been coming from Kepler and other things about potentially habitable planets. And one of the next steps uh, we would like to do is to actually directly image a uh, potentially habitable planet, which would, might look like this uh, uh, little pale blue dot here. Uh, now, uh, some of you may know of some uh, proposed mission concepts designed to do that, and all of them are these large uh, $1 billion plus uh, telescopes launching um, you know, no earlier than the 2020 decade and more likely the 2030s. Uh, but there is uh, one uh, star system which offers a unique opportunity to uh, image a potentially habitable planet if one exists around it. Potentially this decade with a small low-cost telescope. And uh, so this is uh, the main message that uh, um, I, I would like to uh, convince you of with, with my talk here today. And hopefully by, by the end of, of the talk, uh, uh, you, you will see how um, this is not only theoretically possible, but also practical. Uh, so let me move on. Outline. Uh, my talk uh, and Eduardo's uh, cons consists of four main um, parts. First, I'll cover the history and science of exoplanets. Then I'll talk about why uh, Alpha Centauri is so special and unique. Then uh, technology and uh, mission concept that Eduardo and I proposed uh, to, to NASA called ASAT, which is Alpha Centauri Exoplanet Satellite. So the, the, uh, one of the key uh, fundamental questions humanity and particular SETI is uh, interested in is, uh, is there another Earth out there? And is there life on it? <laughs> uh, now, uh, humanity has been pondering these questions for millennia, actually. Is Earth unique? Are there other worlds? Is life unique? And, and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, we did not actually know that planets existed around other stars until about 1995, which uh, was arguably the first extrasolar planet that, that was found. And incidentally, this October, there will be a 20th anniversary um, of the announcement of, of that planet. So, uh, and it's now, uh, the scientific community believed uh, that there are planets around other stars, but we did not actually have proof of this until just 20 years ago. And it's amazing how far we've come since then. We've had lots of discoveries. And uh, the first planets that were found were these big, uh, hot Jupiters and not habitable planets. Uh, and over the past several years, uh, lots of potentially habitable discoveries ha have started happening. And here are, um, here's an example of, uh, of um, some, some of them, particularly these two last ones, Kepler-186F, and recently uh, Kepler-452b has been making headlines uh, of uh, uh, being uh, so far the, arguably the, the most potentially uh, Earth-like or Earth-sized planet found to date. Uh, and uh, Kepler has actually found uh, a number of potentially habitable planets and planet candidates. In this graph, you see uh, the green uh, swath here is the habitable zone uh, of, for different types of stars, sun-like and, and dwarfs. And uh, Kepler has um, a large, uh, well, a, a sizable number of uh, potentially habitable planets orbiting M dwarf. And uh, by now, about 10 or so um, 
candidates that are potentially habitable, and there's uh, 452b. So we're starting to get a lot of potentially habitable planets from, uh, from Kepler, and we're starting to get a handle on how often these planets, these kinds of planets occur around stars, and uh, uh, it, it would be great uh, to then go and start I imaging uh, planets, not, not necessarily these ones because these are uh, a bit far, but uh, imaging planets that are close to us and detecting planets that are close to us is one of, one of the next uh, things that, that we'd like to do. Um, since 1995, we've had uh, over 5,000 exoplanets, and it's candidates and confer confirmed planets that have been discovered. Um, and uh, the confirmed planets is close to 2,000. And there's over 1,000 planetary systems that they orbit. There are several uh, methods that are used for this. Uh, the so -called, uh, there are two so-called wobble methods, which is what happens when a star orbits, uh, when a planet orbits a star, uh, that planet induces a wobble in the star that you can measure. And uh, the, the easiest way to do it is to measure it uh, using the Doppler shift f of the spectrum of the star, uh, which is called radial velocity. Uh, Kepler uses something called the transit method, where a planet passes in front of the face of the star, and you see the brightness of the star dimming, and that's how you detect the, uh, the brightness of the planet. There's also something called gravitational microlensing. Uh, and uh, recently, uh, a new planet detection method has been gaining prominence called direct detection, which is a fancy way of saying you just take a picture of, of a planet. Uh, and uh, so uh, let me um, show you uh, a visualization of uh, some uh, of uh, the planets that have been found and where they are in our galaxy. Uh, this is a uh, a utility that you can see uh, and, and use by yourself. It's made by JPL. It's called Eyes for Exoplanets. Let's see if it's displaying well. So let me just make it full screen. Okay, there we go. So uh, this rep uh, represents our immediate galactic neighborhood. And you can see that uh, all the stars that are highlighted here are stars around which we know that there are planets. And if I zoom out here, you can see this is our Milky Way galaxy. Uh, let me actually do it like this. And you can see a whole bunch of, uh, you can see a little bit of a structure here. Uh, and uh, these planets here are the planets that Kepler has found. And these planets here are microlensing. They're close to, uh, they're in the direction of the galactic center. Uh, and in the immediate vicinity of the sun are mostly radial velocity planets. The Kepler uh, planets, all of them tend to be kind of far from us. Uh, and if we want to see a planet around the nearest stars, arguably direct imaging is uh, uh, might be the most sensitive way of, of doing it. Radial velocity can also see planets that are close to us, but it's not sensitive to certain types of planets, uh, in particular face-on uh, planets with face-on uh, face orbits. Um, so, I, and I believe the nearest Kepler planet is something like a hundred uh, or so light years away. So here's Kepler 96, for example, 434 light years away. Um, so if I zoom in at the sun here. You can see um, a lot of uh, planets, most of which are um, RV planets. Uh, and, but there are lots of, I don't know if you can see there, but there are lots of small stars uh, around which we don't know that there are planets or not. But uh, given the frequency of planets, we're, we're sure that planets exist. We just have not detected them yet because we can detect them with transits and uh, radio velocity sensitive to close-in planets, but not uh, as much to planets in, in the habitable zone. Uh, and uh, uh, one uh, particularly important star, if I can find it here, is Alpha Centauri. So let me zoom in on Alpha Centauri. It's 4.3 light years away from us, and it's a very unique star because it's a, a sun-like star, and it's a binary, so it has, a, it has two sun-like stars, a G-type and, and a K-type. Uh, there is a probable planet around it. It's a hot Earth. It's this Alpha Sand BB. 
you can see it here. Uh, it has a three-day orbit, if, if it exists. Uh, so it's uh, scorching hot. You don't want to live there. If you look at the habitable zone around Alpha Sen, this here is what the habitable zone looks like. And you can see the, uh, the little uh, Alpha Sen BV planet hugging there. So the question is, are there planets in the habitable zone of, of this uh, Alpha Centauri system? And if uh, there are planets around uh, Al the Alpha Centauri system, they might be the, the nearest planets beyond uh, our solar system. So New Horizons has just imaged Pluto. We got these uh, amazing images of Pluto. So what is the next kind of a big object beyond Pluto. It might be a Kuiper Belt object. It might be a free-floating planet. But uh, quite possibly, the next frontier are planets in the Alpha Centauri system. So it would be great to, to, to see those things. And All right. Uh, so let me switch gears now and talk about the direct imaging method of uh, finding exoplanets, as opposed to the indirect methods like the Kepler transit uh, method and uh, radio velocity. So uh, the um, several, direct, several planets have already been directly imaged. And uh, it's not completely clear when the first one was, because we don't know wh which objects are uh, quite planets or not. There's some uh, objects that have been imaged could be uh, not quite planets, but failed stars or something like that. Uh, but uh, one of uh, the, the most uh, kind of w widely cited uh, uh, Im uh, direct images of uh, uh, planets is this system around HR 8799 in 2008. So you can see that direct images of planets look like these little dots orbiting a star. Here's another one orbiting Beta Pictoris and another one orbiting GJ 504b. All of these planets are young planets and they're detectable because they're still hot and uh, they, they shine in infrared. They're pretty bright in infrared. And so we can see them in, in, in infrared light. Uh, once they cool down, like uh, Jupiter in our solar system, they become much harder to detect. Uh, also, they're very far from the star. You can see this one is 8 AU from the star. Uh, this one is tens of AU, and so on. And so we, we have just started picking the easiest low-hanging fruit of, of uh, directly imaged planets, meaning planets that are big, bright in the infrared, and far from the star. And the direction where we want to, to go now is to now see closer to the star, and then see planets not by their infrared light, but by their reflected light, so mature planets, once they've uh, evolved enough for, for life to develop. Uh, and also d smaller planets, uh, basically Earth size. And so th this requires uh, a, um, a lot more capability that, that, than what's currently available. But um, technology has been advancing. And uh, in the lab already, there's arguably capability to do things like this. Now, uh, I've shown you what large planets look like around other stars. Now, what would an Earth-like planet look like uh, around another star? Well, let's take a look at what our own Earth looks like uh, when viewed from far away. Uh, and unfortunately, it looks like uh, this image didn't come across. This was supposed to be a beautiful image taken by the Cassini mission of Saturn. Uh, with a little dot, uh, it's too bad it didn't come out, but with a little dot, which is our own Earth. And if you zoom in on that Earth, you see something like this. And you can even see the moon orbiting around it there. So uh, this is what uh, a planet, our own Earth, looks like from far away within our solar system. Uh, another image uh, was taken by the Voyager sp spacecraft from really far away, 4 billion miles, once Voyager was about to exit the, the um, solar system or close to exiting in 1990. At the request of Carl Sagan, it looked back at our solar system and took this mosaic. And you can see, if you zoom in at, on this frame, a little pale blue dot, which is our Earth here, uh, a little uh, tiny speck of dust uh, in, a, in a beam of sunlight, as, as Carl put it. Uh, and this is that image zoomed in. You can see it looks blue, as our Earth should, because of Rayleigh scattering in the sky. That's why th the sky is blue. Uh, and this is a simulation of what an Earth-like planet would look like with a 0.45-meter telescope, which is our ASAT mission, around Alpha Centauri A. And you can see uh, a Venus-like planet there as well, and even a Mars there. 
So it, it should look remarkably similar, you know, if it's, if, if it's really an Earth-like planet, which is a pale blue dot, has the same color and has color noise uh, all, all, all around it, which, which we can uh, uh, reduce to, to see the planet. An important point is that we will not actually be able to resolve the planet to more than just a little blob. Uh, the actual size of the planet is going to be about 100 times smaller than the apparent size on, on this image. So no continents and, and, and no, no resolving features on, on the planet for a while. But it's remarkable how much information we can get from this one unresolved dot. Uh, one thing we can do is we can see what its light curve is, how uh, the brightness of the planet changes. And if we see a periodic vari diurnal uh, variation, that would uh, indicate how uh, long the day is on the planet. We can also uh, construct uh, models of how the planet would vary, and that'll tell us something about the, the surface uh, uh, composition. And also, if we see chaotic variations, that would indicate the presence of weather or seasonal variations uh, of brightness would indicate presence of seasons. So this is all this information that we can get from, from that uh, one dot. Um, arguably, one of the uh, most exciting things we can get from, from that one dot, however, is a spectrum. Um, here are spectra of our own uh, Earth-like, if you will, planets, uh, if you consider Venus and Mar Mars uh, Earth-like. You can see that on Earth, you, uh, you can see this Rayleigh scattering, which is the uh, presence of a relatively uh, cloud-free atmosphere. Uh, and strong oxygen features and water features and basically uh, biomarkers that indicate the presence of life, which are absent from Mars and Venus. Mars and Venus, the dominant feature you see in the spectrum here is carbon dioxide. And if we can take a spectrum like this of an extrasolar planet uh, and an extrasolar Earth uh, or potentially habitable planet, we can start uh, extracting information about what's in the atmosphere and assess its potential for habitability. And in particular, if we have a strong detection of oxygen in an Earth-like planet, it would be difficult to explain it any other way than life. Because on Earth, for example, if life were to disappear, oxygen would also disappear on a million years, which is a blink of an eye in geological time scales. So uh, if we detect oxygen on an extrasolar planet, uh, on, on a small uh, extrasolar planet in a habitable zone, it would be highly suggestive of life. Now let me switch gears a little bit and talk about the um, engineering requirements for what it would take to directly image uh, a planet, uh, and especially what it would take to do it around a binary star like Alpha Centauri. So uh, first of all, uh, just around a single star, uh, you need Contrast, which means the brightness difference between the star and the planet, uh, should be 10 to the 10 for um, Earth-like planets, which means that basically the brightness difference between our sun and our Earth is 10 billion. It's a pretty big number. Uh, and uh, also, in a working angle, the smaller the better, of course, but typically 1 to 3 lambda over d is required on, on missions. And lambda over d refers to the diffraction limit of the telescope. So there are two main challenges. Planets are much, much dimmer than their star, and they're very close to, um, to the uh, star. And just to, to illustrate this point, um, imagine a star as a uh, lighthouse and an Earth-like planet as a little firefly uh, buzzing around the, the, the searchlight there, uh, and uh, uh, try to pick out the firefly from by looking at this lighthouse from uh, 10 miles away. And the, the uh, challenge goes deeper than that, because if you look at, uh, say, uh, the Hubble um, telescope, what, what it can do, uh, this is a Hubble image, and if we zoom in on any star, and this is true for any telescope, not just the Hubble, uh, a um, star that, it look, uh, that a telescope looks at might look like this with uh, Im you know, imaginary orbits of the planets there. But when a telescope images the this, this star, if we ex take an exposure long enough to see planets, what we would see is that. Uh, we see the star is very bright, and it also has lots of diffraction rings. Now, the planetary system might look like that if we can get rid of the star. But as long as the star is there, uh, what we see is that. And there are solutions to uh, block the star. And the solutions come in two general classes, uh, 
an internal coronagraph, which means you block the star inside the telescope, and a star shade, which means you fly a big shield in front of the telescope to block the star. I will primarily focus on the coronagraph solution uh, in, in my talk, uh, although some of the ideas we have are applicable to, to the star shade as well. And uh, uh, there's a, uh, JPL has developed a movie showing how a coronagraph works and general principles. Uh, you can see this movie for yourself on um, online and So if you imagine a telescope looking at a star uh, and a light beam entering the telescope, this light beam contains the star and the planet. Uh, you, if you just image it, you see a star with its area rings like this. So first of all, you have to block the star and remove the area rings. You have to remove the known light that's there. Uh, when you do that, what's left, and, and the planet light, by the way, misses this mask. And it goes on there. Uh, when you do that, however, uh, if you expose long enough to see the planet, you see imperfections from your telescope optics. And in order to remove these imperfections, they're random. So you have to have an adaptable device, which is a deformable mirror, to start removing this light, which you can do. And once you do that, uh, you see planets emerging from the stellar glare. So there are two main components. There's a coronagraph to remove the known uh, diffraction that's there. And you need a wavefront control system based on a deformable mirror to remove the random errors that are there from random telescope optics and misalignments. Uh, here are some exoplanet missions uh, that uh, NASA is planning. There are also uh, other non-NASA missions that uh, the Europeans and, and other agencies are planning. And um, the direct imaging missions are, uh, so JWST, the James Webb Telescope, will have limited direct imaging capability. We also have w First AFTA and uh, the New Worlds Telescope. So w First AFTA is a flagship, uh, NASA's flagship in the 2020s, and New Worlds Telescope is a, f uh, a proposed flagship in the 2030s, and it has uh, different names. Uh, w First AFTA may, uh, it's not designed to detect Earth-like planets, but it may just be able to do it if it's lucky. And the New Worlds Telescope is, or uh, LUFWAR, as it's sometimes called, or um, and you guys may have seen uh, another study for the so-called High Definition Space Telescope. That's the one that uh, the community is hoping would really search a lot of stars for, uh, for uh, Earth-like planets. And this is all supported by NASA's documents. So this is definitely something we want to do. Um, however, there is an opportunity in, inside here to um, image Alpha Centauri. And uh, in, in, if an Earth-like planet exists around Alpha Centauri, to get it before uh, these telescopes and, and not, without having to wait till the 2030s to do that. Uh, so let me now uh, switch gears and, and focus on, on uh, Alpha Centauri a little bit more. Uh, this graph here uh, represents a landscape of direct imaging, if you will. Uh, and it plots uh, planets, uh, real planets that have been discovered and hypothetical planets on contrast versus separation angle from the star. So uh, you can see this here are planets that are one arc second away from the star, 10 arc seconds and 0.1 arc second. And this is how dimmer the planets are than, uh, than their star. And these dots here represent planets that have already been imaged that I've shown a few um, slides ago. And the capability that currently exists uh, with uh, coronagraphs on, on the ground and in space is roughly confined to this region, which is uh, large uh, Jupiter-sized planets. All of these dots that I've plotted here represent hypothetical um, Earth-like planets around every nearby star. So if there was an Earth-like planet around every nearby star, this is where they would lie. And uh, you can see here in this region are um, Earth-like planets around sun-like stars. And in this region are Earth-like planets around M dwarfs. Uh, and uh, so uh, this blue region represents the capability that uh, um, the community is developing to image Earth-like planets around sun-like stars. Uh, but as we go um, farther away from, from the Earth is, is equivalent to this direction here. 
um, we need larger and larger telescopes. So you can see that a 1 to 2.4 meter telescope, such as w First after, if it can get to deep enough contrasts, is in principle capable of detecting Earth's around a dozen or two dozen or so stars, including Epseri and Tau Ceti here. Uh, to get hundreds of stars, to search hundreds of stars for Earth-like exoplanets nearby, you really need large four meter plus uh, flagship missions. There's also an opportunity with ground-based extremely large telescopes to, to start imaging planets around dim stars such as M dwarfs, but the habitability of such planets is a bit controversial. Um, so, but uh, the, uh, the main point I'd like to, to uh, make about this slide is take a look at where Alpha Centauri is. It's separated from this whole big uh, kind of blob of uh, Earth-like planets and there, by, a, by an order of magnitude, basically, no matter how you look at it. Uh, you might think that Alpha Centauri is just a nearest star and it's the tip of the iceberg of uh, stars around which we, we might search for Earth-like planets. But that's not actually the case. Epsilon Eridani and Tau Ceti, that's the tip of the iceberg. Alpha Centauri is its own iceberg. It's, it's a very unusual outlier. It's a sun-like star, or, or a pair of sun-like stars, at least if you, if you ignore Proxima Sun. Uh, and, uh, but the most common star type in the galaxy is an M dwarf. So by all probability, M dwarfs should be the closest star to us, but it's not, it's, it's, it's this one. Uh, and uh, it, uh, the, the habitable zone around Alpha Centauri is on the order of one arc second, which is huge. It's resolvable by small telescopes that uh, you know, many of us have in, in our backyards. And uh, a 30 centimeter telescope can already resolve the habitable zone uh, of, of Alpha Centauri pretty well. And so a small telescope, 30 to 40 centi 45 centimeters, if it can get to 10 to the 10 contrast, is capable of directly imaging an Earth-like planet around, if one exists around Alpha Centauri. Uh, let me uh, now uh, talk about, uh, give you a little bit more information about Alpha Centauri. As I said, uh, Alpha Centauri is mainly a binary star system. It, it does have a Proxima, uh, an M dwarf called Proxima Centauri, which is very far away from the binary and may or may not actually be gravitationally bound. But for, for our purposes, it would be very challenging to detect Earth-like planets around Proxima. So I'll focus on Alpha Centauri A and B, which are close to, which are roughly sun-like stars. Uh, here's an orbit of Alpha Sen B as it goes around A. Uh, he, here's where it is right now. The separation between them right now uh, is roughly five arc seconds, I believe. And now this is uh, a zoomed in version of that plot. Here's Alpha Sen A, Alpha Sen B. You can see Alpha Sen B orbiting Alpha Sen A. Uh, and in the green here is uh, shown the habitable zone around both of the stars. And uh, this box here is 0.4 arc seconds, which is an inner, the inner working angle of our ASET mission, which is a 45 centimeter telescope. Uh, and uh, the, two planet, the two stars are sufficiently far away that you should have stable habitable zones around both of them. Uh, planets uh, in the habitable zone would orbit each star separately as opposed to uh, orbiting the, the pair of them. Uh, and by comparison, here's what our uh, solar system uh, would, would look like. Now, uh, latest estimates of how common uh, Earth-like planets occur around these stars uh, range from 10% uh, to as, as high as 50%, and, and maybe the, the average is about uh, 20%. So the chances that we have an Earth-like planet around at least one of these, uh, if eta sub Earth is 20%, then the chances that uh, there would be a planet around at least one of them is about 40%. If eta sub Earth is uh, 50%, which is on kind of on the high end of what people have been publishing, then the, the chances go up to 75%. Which, uh, so the, I, I think these chances are higher than, say, Columbus had uh, of discovering America. Uh, and uh, if, if you think about it, if you're willing to pay $1 billion for a large uh, mission to, to detect an Earth-like planet or to guarantee uh, de detecting an Earth-like planet with some high probability, how much would you be willing to pay for a 40% chance uh, of, of detecting an, an Earth-like planet? All right, uh, now uh, let me talk about why imaging Alpha Sen with a small telescope used to be a um, 
crazy idea and uh, why uh, it's, I don't think it's, it's uh, not anymore. Uh, now, I've described to you how we might deal with one star. But alpha sen is a binary star system. So the first question that immediately comes up, uh, and I think is the reason why, why people haven't looked into this uh, too seriously until now, is how do you deal with the other star? How do you block it? Uh, we have a new breakthrough technology that we've been developing called multi-star wafer control to deal with that. The second uh, question that always comes up is, you still have to solve the 10 to the 10 uh, contrast problem, which is very challenging on a $1 billion mission. How the heck are you going to solve it on a small telescope uh, and, and, and do that? And we have an answer to that as well. Uh, and the answer is basically we focus all of our mission time on a single target, which means that we do not need to get to the 10 to, 10 to the 10 raw contrast performance. We only need 10 to the 8. And we can get go the rest of the way with post-processing, having the benefit of a long mission t uh, time on a single target. Uh, and also, a third, uh, third kind of uh, most common objection that comes up is that there's a common wisdom that astrophysics noise, such as confusion with background uh, sources and, and so on, would prevent the detection of a, of a planet uh, on a small telescope, because these problems get much more difficult with a small telescope. And uh, the, the, the answer to that is that Alpha Centauri is so unusually close that uh, all of your common wisdom about such thing goes out the window and you have to reassess everything. And it actually turns out that everything is, is OK. Um, so uh, let me uh, describe um, the, some of the technologies that we're doing. Uh, Multi-star wavefront control relies on using the deformable mirror to remove uh, the random errors from the two stars separately. And the key idea here is that it's possible to use the same deformable mirror <laughs> To block, in, to independently suppress the uh, the light from both stars, if you use separated modes on the DM, so you can you can use independent modes on your deformable mirror for star A and uh, for star B. And the picture that uh, uh, we have is basically mu this multi-star wavefront control will get us to 10 to the 8 contrast. And then we can go the rest of the way using uh, what we call orbital differential imaging, which is a post-processing technique where, where you analyze the data. And the key there is we are going to have tens of thousands of images around Alpha Centauri. Uh, and uh, on each image, the contrast is 10 to the 8, so you can't see the planet. But since you have so many images, you can, uh, and you, you have uh, images covering the entire orbits of, of the planets, you can then go and extract these planets from, uh, from your, uh, e even though they are much, much dimmer than, than the noise there. And we have a simulation showing how that's done. So this is a processed <coughs> two-year sequence of, uh, of uh, a 45-centimeter telescope looking at Alpha Centauri, starting with about 10 to the 8 contrast. And we can process that to extract planets orbiting around the star. And you can see some frames there. You can see an Earth-like planet, a Venus-like planet, and a Mars-like planet. And you can further boost uh, their signal-to-noise if you actually co-add uh, the images along the orbit, You're extracting all of these planets from within uh, noise that's 100 times higher. So this is how we, we solve the 10 to the 10 uh, contrast problem. Uh, there, there are also. Um, uh, th this, this chart shows that confusion with background sources is also not an issue. Uh, this is a si simulation of a habitable zone around Alpha Centauri and stars that might cause confusion. And the key here is, uh, first of all, uh, the probability of confusion in any given image is about 3%, as it turns out. And also, the proper motion of Alpha Centauri is huge. It's, uh, <coughs> it's four arc seconds per year. Not milli arc seconds, four arc seconds. So, uh, you, everything will just zoom by, and you, you, you won't be able to, to uh, see any, um, uh, a, a, any, any potentially confusing star would just zoom by. And you can rule, rule, rule that out because of that. Uh, OK, so let me uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about the technology and the hardware that, that uh, we're developing. Uh, this is uh, the Ames Chronograph Experiment Research Group. and. Uh, 
you can see Eduardo is, is there, by the way. Uh, this is a little bit outdated. We have had some uh, turnover uh, on as, as usual with, with groups. And I'm going to zoom by in the interest of time uh, through these slides a little bit uh, faster. But uh, we've this is what our hardware looks like, and we're testing all of these concepts. Uh, the uh, coro particular coronagraph that we're using is the so-called phase-induced amplitude optimization coronagraph, which is a high-performance coronagraph uh, and another thing that enables a small telescope to, to image uh, planets uh, around Alpha Centauri. Um, and uh, so let me jump straight, straight to, um, uh, to Eduardo as part of the talk. Uh, but before I do that, um, I I you're welcome to uh, go to this uh, uh, link here, which is a virtual video uh, tour of, of our lab, if, if, if you're interested. Uh, so at this point, let me hand it over to Eduardo to talk about a mission uh, proposal that we submitted in December. Uh, called ASAT, Alpha Centauri Exoplanet Satellite, and Eduardo has been instrumental in, in getting this done and is the deputy principal investigator for, for this. Good afternoon. So uh, I'm going to explain a little bit the, the mission that we submitted to accomplish the goal that uh, Russ described. But before into going into the detail, I would like to um, tell you what is the inspiration and the rationale behind this. Uh, NASA is trying to pursue this um, goal of exoplanet. If you see on the roadmap and on the all the strategic plan of NASA, you see that one of the main goals is if, uh, to determine if we are alone or not. That uh, main strategic goal has pushed NASA to present several concepts, which are XOC, that will be first, and a long sequence of missions. And we believe that those concepts are very good, but they are a little bit far ahead on the technology. So we see an opportunity for NASA Ames in particular to take all the heritage and the success of Kepler and take that and continue the path toward direct imaging with more models to smaller missions that are lower cost and rapid development that can focus on particularly Alpha Centauri because it's the only system that we can look at with a small telescope. Now, um, we started with a, a smaller concept and during the development of the proposal, we start to face risks and the mission start to grow and grow to mitigate risk because at the end of the day, is. Uh, it's always a trade-off of uh, uncertainty versus money. And um, we end up submitting um, this um, mission for a ex Mexico. And um, we finally decide on a 45 centimeter telescope instead of 30 centimeter telescope, just to have more margin on resolution and signal to noise. And uh, also, instead of going to low, low Earth orbit or geo orbit, a geostationary orbit, uh, we selected an um, Earth trailing orbit like Kepler. So in some, uh, in many aspects of the mission, we're mimicking what um, Kepler is doing. It's a similar orbit, uh, similar communication scheme, and uh, that helped us to leverage uh, all the experience that Kepler uh, and reliability that Kepler um, has brought to the community. Also, we we innovate a lot on the kind of telescope. It's, um, I'm going to show that in detail later, but that's kind of the, the spirit behind all this uh, proposal. Uh, our partners are, um, of course, NASA, uh, Loral Space System that is uh, across the street here. Loral manufactured the biggest uh, telecom satellites in the world. And um, they regularly launch uh, this telecom satellite and our, they're going to provide the the spacecraft and also the launch because we're going to go on top of them on one of their payload. Uh, Northrop Grumman is the contractor for the structure of the telescope and Lockheed Martin will provide testing facilities. Over there is the team, uh, um, engineering and science team. Uh, there are a lot more people that is not listed there, but those are the people that help the most. Here, there are the instrument building blocks that Russ already mentioned a little bit, but uh, from a from an engineering perspective, um, there is a key element to which is a telescope. 
that is completely specialized for this task. So one of the reasons that other missions cannot do this because they try to do too much, which is what you need to justify the science and the cost. However, our um, focus is totally specialized. So we build a telescope absolutely around this target, and everything on the telescope is sought to be able to achieve this science. Um, so the interesting part is that this telescope is already a coronagraph. So on a normal telescope, you have the primary, the secondary, the tertiary, and then you go into the instrument. Here, since we're not going to do any other science, we just built part of the coronagraph, these very special mirrors that Ras was mentioned, on the optical train of the, of the primary and the secondary. The reasons to do that is you uh, increase the throughput. So on every reflection, you have a problem of losing photons, but also inducing aberrations. And we're very sensitive to aberrations because those create little speckles that looks like planet. So you want to get rid of those. Uh, and the best way to do that is minimizing the number of optical surfaces. Also, to have a very high stability, so the whole telescope is uh, made out of silicon carbide, the optics and the structure. Silicon carbide is a new high technology ceramic that has a low coefficient of expansion, is very stiff, has uh, several advantages. So we conceived the instrument, just the optics, that will get us to 10 to a minus 5 contrast. This I'm taking the same uh, uh, plot of contrast that Russ showed before. So if you just point the telescope to a star, you're going to have a, a contrast of 10 to a minus 5. Then we take the deformable mirror and the multi-star waveform control, we run the algorithm, and this deformable mirror will take care of the tiny, small imperfections that will remain on the optics, and also caused uh, by launch vibration and by thermal changes and we'll remove those little speckles that are shown there and create a dark zone. But to get to a 10 to a 10 contrast, that is what we need for Alpha Centauri, still is very challenging. Uh, so we believe our best, uh, current best estimate is that we can be a little bit better, it's 10 to a minus 9 contrast, but just for the sake of margin, our, our official performance is 10 to, a, 10 to the 8. And then it comes uh, orbital differential imaging, which is uh, what Russ described of using 20,000 images to recover uh, this planet signal from the data. And that buy us the last little bit of, um, of contrast that we need to detect the planet. Now, it's interesting to, to, um, to basically insist on the fact that on any single image, we're not going to see a planet. And that's tricky because, to some extent, um, it is uh, a little bit discouraging. However, when you put all the data together, the speckles are going to be random, are going to have a random motion, and the planets are going to have a Keplerian motion. So that allows you to recover whether it's a planet and whether it's a speckle. And this concept is fairly new, so we, we are trying to do several things to make this more robust, and actually we have been recently talking about trying to do this from the ground, and there are different uh, approaches just to demonstrate that the concept works. Now, uh, is this? Oh, it's very weak, but here, uh, here's a plot that Russ showed before that with, the, with the spectral characteristic of different planets. And that drives the way that our instrument works. So we're going to have five bands. So the instrument will be able to separate the light in five colors. And those bands are going to be imaged in parallel in the CCD. So on the detector, we're going to see all the images at the same time, yeah? uh, and which is very good because allow us to be more efficient. Uh, now, it's interesting that this deformable mirror that can kill these little speckles, it can work well only for one color at a time. So what's going to happen is that on all those little squares, which is a one of, um, so each of those square is a monochromatic image of the planet or and the star and the dark zone. However, we cannot optimize all of them at the same time. So we're going to do one, then the other, then the other, and cycle around. In the meantime, all the other bands are going to still be visible, but not with the same high contrast. 
still we can rec we think that we can recover some more inf information from the other colors. Um, here there is a visualization of the conceptual design of the telescope. You can see here on the right is a top and bottom view of the silicon carbide structure that will host the optics. Uh, on the back there is a primary uh, mirror. Everything is made out of the same material and the connections are made in such a way to minimize any, any um, misalignment. And the secondary, so the primary send the light into a secondary that is here, and the secondary is the first PI element, one of these special mirrors. And also this mirror has a particularly uh, mount that will allow to compensate vibrations of the telescope because the, the telescope has reaction wheels that vibrate and we cannot uh, tolerate vibrations because the problem is you have this very bright star that Russ was describing and you have a, a planet very close to it. So what you do is you put a mask that rejects the light of the star. However, if the telescope is vibrating, all the sun, part of the light of the star will go around and will blow the CCD and then you're going to lose all the data. So it's very important that we can control vibration. So there will be this tiny mirror that will take care of putting the, keeping the light on the mask and avoiding bleeding into the camera. Uh, so the, the concept is a um, preliminary concept. It's not very detailed, but that's um, what on a, there has been mechanical and thermal analysis on this and to first order it works. And uh, this is the mission concept. So we, we're going to launch with the rocket that's taking um, telecom satellite. Once we're in, in geotransfer orbit, we're going to separate and we have our own propulsion to go, and, uh, to, go to our Earth trailing orbit. Earth trailing orbit is that we are not orbiting anymore the Earth, we are starting to orbit the Sun. And by doing that, we gain a lot of stability and we can be on a very, uh, beneficial environment or uh, uh, an environment that won't cause instabilities that will perturb our, our measurements. Uh, now, another interesting fact here is that to make orbital differential imaging work, every perturbation on the satellite need to happen on a time scale that is different than the time that the planet takes from one pixel to the other. So when you have uh, the star, the planet is orbiting the star. And um, if you divide the image on the resolution that we're going to have, it will take like a month for the planet to move from one resolution element to the next. Now imagine that you perturb the telescope with a frequency of one month, you're going to exactly match more or less the transition of a planet to the next resolution element. And that will destroy the way that orbital differential imaging works because between one differential uh, resolution element and the next, there is some noise. Now, it turns out that if you just pick a normal spacecraft and you put reaction wheels, due to solar pressure, they will accumulate air inertia and they will start to accelerate. And there is a moment in which you have to stop and desaturate the wheels. That means to uh, slow them down and fire thrusters to go back to zero again. Now, we started with normal reaction wheels and uh, using those, we couldn't go past the month deadline. So we have to put larger reaction wheels and we have to take care of uh, a lot of tiny details and also symmetry of the spacecraft to reduce solar wind and solar torque in order to be able to desaturate every three months. So what we do is we have a, a period of operation of one quarter and every quarter we just observe at Alpha Centauri. We don't move, we don't desaturate, we don't send data with the high gain antenna. We don't do anything beside observing Alpha Centauri. And after three months, we desaturate the reaction wheels, we point the high gain antenna, we download the data, and then we go back and we start over. So this concept of operation is very interesting. It uh, took us a while to kind of figure out a way that will be credible to do this, but I think that we came, there's a lot more detail that I'm not going into, but um, I think that what, what we have now is pretty solid. Um, now also, as part of this uh, effort to uh, mitigate risk and to advance te technology, um, I'm proposing this mission concept that is called Centaur. Uh, and of course, because we want to observe Alpha Centauri, but this is mostly a scientific and technology pathfinder. It's not really meant to 
see the planet, to see Alpha Centauri, but the idea of this mission is to take the whole concept and package it on a, sm on a smaller satellite with a, sl uh, with a much less cost and rapid development and test the whole system and get to a level of precision that will allow us to retire some astrophysical risk like uh, assessing what is the level of exosody. Like exosody is the amount of dust on the system. Each planetary system has some dust on it. If there is too much dust, uh, for us the threshold is about 30 sodi, so 30 times more, more dust than in our system. It gets very difficult to see a planet because it's like there is fog. Imagine when there is fog around, you don't see very well, or when you are in a dirt road and a car goes by and leaves dust, you cannot see very well. So if there is a lot of dust, you need a bigger telescope to recover the signal of the planet. Um, so Centaur is meant to do technology development and also to retire some, some of those risks and pave the way for a larger mission. This is also useful for any other mission uh, that NASA has. If you look at technology development plant of NASA for exoplanet detection, this mission will test all like 90% of those technologies that are necessary. So that's the reason that uh, also I'm pushing for this. Um, and then uh, we have uh, the conclusions um, that we believe that uh, imagining an Earth-like planet is uh, feasible and it's very challenging. We're really pushing the technology, but uh, it is within reach. And I think that is, is very cool to, to try to do that. Um, a small telescope, 30 or 45 centimeter telescope, will do it. In the case of Centauri, it's only 15 centimeter because we want to do it affordable. So instead of 100 or 200 million, Centauri is costed at 10. And um, we have new enabling technologies that change the game and allow to do this that was not possible five years ago. Um, and the other thing uh, it's very important is the fact that, uh, thanks to Kepler, we know that the probability of finding a planet around Alpha Centauri is fairly big or large. Therefore, we, we can propose a reasonable science case to say, look, there is a reasonable likelihood that around Alpha Centauri there is a planet, so let's go and look for it. And this is important because so far there are four space missions looking at transit. So there is Kepler, then there is TESS, there will be Cheops and Plato. So two American and two European missions. So four missions doing science that uh, each one has a different niche, but somehow is similar. And Kepler is the precursor and is the one that brought the most results. But all the other missions, what they're doing is they're surveying populations. And the ultimate goals of those missions is say, look, this is the probability that there is a planet like the Earth around any star that you pick on the sky. So from our point of view, uh, now there is a moment in which there is value on going after a particular target and not doing any more survey. I'm not saying that the other missions are not valuable, but I think that it's good to kind of keep a balance between the, the, uh, that, that approach. And that's part of our value proposition is to, to take that information and make it into something that we can go and dig in and observe. Even the null result, which is if we don't find any planet, has value because will know that there is no planet there and there is uh, no reason for other missions to look at that target. Also, it will inform about the precision of the statistics and will help. So thank you very much. And that's uh, all what we have to say. Um, we'll have both speakers come over here. And as Adrian has instructed me, I have to ask the first question. <laughs> So uh, remember in October 2012, our research group had a big press release, and then the same day somebody said, oh, drop that. They found a planet around Alpha Centauri. So that's going to be the, the news of the day. And since then, that planet has faded a bit. Uh, some people are not so sure <laughs> that it exists. Does the existence of that planet influence your design strategy, anything about your plans? Uh, I think that we can both answer yeah. this from different perspectives. I used to work at, at <coughs> ESO and I used to work at ESO and uh, this observatory, La Silla, where HARPS detected this planet, and they took data for almost like three years. I don't remember exactly, and I'm not a specialist on um, radial velocity. However, I, I think that they were pushing the technology to the limit. The sensitivity of that instrument is 50 centimeters per second, and the signal that they were trying to get was 
50 per centimeter per second. So when you're working at that level, you're really pushing the limit and your certainty about a discovery or not is marginal. So it really depends at the end on the, on the assumptions that you make and the quality of the data, whether the discovery is true or not. So that's from the technical point of view. And um, imagine 50 centimeters per second means that you are able to see a whole star moving much slower than uh, the, the speed that a person walks. So 50 centimeters per second is like very slow pace work. So being able to detect if the star is moving slower than a person is pretty challenging. Um, no, it's true. I mean, when you put the, now to detect a planet like the Earth around Alpha Centauri with radial velocity means that you have to measure the velocity of the star with 10 centimeter per second. So at 10 centimeter per second, it will take, I don't know, hours to get to the door. And you need to, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. So. So you need to be able to see the star while moving at that speed while you have giant solar flares and the star doing crazy astrophysical phenomena and magnetic fields and you need to be able to see that tiny movement. So this is very challenging and answering your question, uh, I went a little bit on a branch. Now really answering if that helps to assess if there is a planet Al Alpha Centauri I think that is yes, but I am not a specialist on planetary formation, and I think Russ has a better yeah. uh, take on yeah. that. So, you, you, uh, you know, you got it uh, exactly right with the RV estimates, but uh, uh, does the planet, uh, does the probable planet around Alpha Centauri influence our mission design? Uh, I, I would say uh, to, to some degree, but the more important point is that it uh, increases the case for, for this mission because it decreases the chances of a null result for a few reasons. One is that if this planet is real, we know that a planetary system has formed around Alpha Centauri. So there's some you know, controversy, can planets form around binary si uh, systems? But if this planet is real, we know that a planetary system has formed. And second, we know that there isn't a hot Jupiter around Alpha Centauri, actually but around both stars. And if, if there's a hot Jupiter around uh, a star, uh, then uh, the, the way that it got there is it migrated inward and could have swept in any potentially habitable planets. We know that that has not happened around Alpha Centauri, so the conditional probability that an Earth-like planet exists around Alpha Centauri, given that there isn't a hot Jupiter, is higher than just around any random star. Okay. Uh, we'll go starting with Seth. And then I'm going to go this way. Uh, just a comment, uh, 10 centimeters a second, it will take two minutes to get to the door. <laughs> <laughs> it's great, it's faster it than you guys door. expected. Can, yeah. can I just ask you, you know, the, some of the most interesting things here are the diurnal variations where you started off for us. Uh, and, and how are you going to do that if you have to average tens of thousands of images to even see the thing? Uh, yeah, so basically the, the way to th we, we would do that is uh, uh, we can, uh, we would not be able to see, at least with this mission, a single diurnal variation. But if we have a year's worth of, uh, of images, we can then construct like a Fourier you know, transform of, of the images. And then uh, even though one day worth of images isn't enough to see, or a few days isn't enough to see it, once you, uh, have two years worth, then you can average things in a Fourier transform type of way to see these signals. Can so, big uh, yes. Uh, well, uh, it, it, they would be m marginal for you know for, for, for this mission, but still detectable. Uh, and uh, m the point that I was making uh, is not not just in the context of this small mission, but just direct imaging in general. This is what it can do. This mission in particular can still do that. Uh, if you have two years worth of images. Uh, I would like to add something there mm -hmm. is, I think on, on our sense traceability matrix, we're not, on uh, our science calls, we're not offering to detect diurnal variation due to clouds or continents or rotation period uh, because it's really too challenging. I think uh, we need to be realistic on what the capabilities are and I think adjust being able to see a planet with five colors, it's already a huge achievement and get the picture and the orbit is. Uh, so I, I think that sometimes could be detrimental to try to do more science than what we really think that we can achieve. Nevertheless, I think that there's still some hope of detecting glint. So if you have ocean glint, 
it's it's very and this is sometimes is very controversial uh, but uh, what it can happen that despite that our contrast is not enough to see the planet on a single image if all of a sudden you have a phenomena that increases the brightness of the planet like a glint or let's say a volcano eruption or whatever then uh, then we will be able to recover the planet from particular images so I think that in that sense there is still some hope for to see a special phenomena Hi, I have an engineering question. Uh, given what happened with the reaction wheels and Kepler and Dawn, uh, I'm a little concerned about reaction wheels in general, and I was wondering if you had any redundancy built in or other things to prevent the kind of failures that we saw in those missions. Yeah, okay. absolutely. For us, uh, that is critical. And we are adding two more reaction wheels, so instead of four, we're going with six for redundancy. <laughs> Another. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing with the reaction wheel is that since they are oversized, because we don't want to uh, desaturate them often, that also makes the reaction wheel more working most of the time at a lower speed, making it the, the reliability uh, easier. So I think that if you compare side to side what happened with Kepler and what we have with us, we have uh, several advantages, which is uh, or not advantage, but we learned the lesson, is that we have uh, two more reaction wheels, we have uh, bigger reaction wheels that make them work uh, easier, and also we, are, we have a shorter mission. Kepler was four, uh, or the, the reaction will fail after four years? Three. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, we, our uh, mission is going to be two years, so that makes everything uh, easier for us. Okay. So I have two questions. One is, what happens if you extend the mission beyond two years? How much sensitivity do you gain? So I think that what you gain is mostly completeness. So t with two years, we're aiming to 96% completeness. So that means that we don't miss the planet because we don't didn't cover the whole orbit. I think that if we extend the mission, probably we're going to try to reach out to other targets and constrain what is on Sirius or Procyon. And that's kind of a, uh, we, in principle, we have fuel and expendables for three years. Uh, however, the science to be done in that extra years, I wouldn't venture to uh, to say exactly what we're going to do. I don't know if you Yeah, have well, we, we get uh, really marginal returns if we observe for more than two years, assuming everything works as planned. Uh, the one, one year gives us a little bit of a margin if if we you know if things don't don't work as planned to get more images. But uh, what the, the the plan is to uh, have an extended mission to look at other stars, as Eduardo uh, mentioned. Around those other stars, we wouldn't be able to see Earth-like planets. Alpha Centauri is the only one that's possible to do with the telescope this size. Uh, but we still we can still do uh, lots of non potentially habitable planet science during an extended mission around other stars. And my other question is, what is it that's keeping you from optimizing the five color bands simultaneously? Is that, right. um, so because of diffraction, the way that light works, uh, the speckles, uh, they have chromaticity. So each, each speckle has a um, color, and when you observe it in all the bands at the same time, they kind of get elongated. So uh, you cannot use one deformable mirror to correct them in all the colors in what is called broadband. So we're aiming to do this in 10% band. That means that we're not absolutely monochromatic like a laser. We're taking a little bit of uh, broadband light. Uh, so for example, from brown to dark red, to put it on, a, on simple terms. But um, if you keep extending that, what happens is that the, these speckles get distorted and a stretch because of wavelength. So that constrained the limit. Uh, now, no, no. But however, if the deformable mirror and our technique ca can get improved beyond what we can do now, there's something very nice that at the end, you're going to have two move bands that are going to deliver the desired construct instead of one at the same time. So for example, band one and two will be at the level of contrast that we need, and we're going to lose the other three. Even if we keep improving, maybe even in the best case, we'll be able to image the five of them at the same time, boosting tremendously the science and the confidence. But it can only get better. That's kind of uh, the approach of breaking the bands in 10%. Um, Kiaris Murthy. 
uh, there are two aspects I want to cover. Um, one of them is the dust that you were talking about. Are you using any uh, dust phobic uh, nano uh, material coating or electric, uh, electrostatic pulsing to be able to get rid of at some intervals and so on once you detect the uh, dust are, dust are there? So uh, the dust is dust on the planetary system that we're observing. Oh, there, OK. Not so on, it's not, not, not going optics. to contaminate our optics. Yeah. Now, there, there is uh, some precaution about the, your propulsion that when you fire the thrusters, when you're in vacuum, and if you don't manage the temperature properly, you can have self-coating of your own thrusting propulsion on the mirror. So we have some uh, precautions and to uh, avoid that. Y y when you're using five spectral uh, uh, portions of it, it may be a better idea to overlap a little bit between one and the other and the other, where you get gain a lot of resolution by d doing the overlap. We can discuss offline. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, we have to look in detail yeah, into yeah. that, but yeah. thank you for the comment. Could you say a little bit more about how a deformable mirror is used to suppress the second star? Yeah. Sure. Um, and I think uh, here we have a uh, complementary uh, complementary visions, sure. but um, imagine that you have a surface, and let's put a very simple example, which is trying to make uh, an image, a perfect image from collimated light. That means the sun that is uh, uh, irradiating the Earth by the distance from the sun to the Earth, the light is coming completely flat. It's a flat wavefront, so it's collimated light. And then the surface that you need to make a point source to match the sun perfectly, it will be a parabola. Now, imagine that we replace the sun for any kind of star on the sky, Alpha Centauri by itself. So you want to get an image of a perfect star. Now, for that, you need this parabola pointing at the star. And that will work perfectly. Now, imagine that you put a tiny little bump on the parabola. What happens is that the, if you have the parabola like this, and all the sun there is a bump, that's going to send light like this. Now, if the bump is irregular, it's going to send a little bit of scatter light here and there, creating these speckles. Because not all the light is going to fall where the star should form in the image plane. Now, what happened is you say, OK, but you can make a good mirror. And I say, yeah, we can make a good mirror. The problem is when you want to achieve 10 billion time contrast, this little rays or any little bump will send away a lot of light that will create these speckles. So the problem is so difficult to keep the surfaces, the optical surfaces, to the, to the level of accuracy that we need, that the formal mirror is the only way to compensate for all the accumulated aberrations on all the mirrors, because it's not only one mirror. There are several of them. So the formal mirror can move and adjust to resend those rays that are going on the wrong direction and to put them where they are supposed to go. So that's approach. I don't know if Russ has something to uh, add. Sure. Well, so but what was your question specifically about how we use it for the second star or just in general? Well, I didn't understand what, 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 how it was related to getting rid of the second star. The second star. OK. So uh, the way it's related is, is, is this. The main challenge uh, of the second star is, is not to really block the, you know, the, 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 the known star light that, that's coming from it. It's, it's to, to block the random uh, you know, speckles due to random uh, optical imperfections of the telescope. Because the, star, the, the second star is actually sufficiently far away that if you have um, a um, a, a really good telescope, uh, you know, uh, e even if you block it with a coronagraph, even if you block the second star with a coronagraph, you will still have light from random telescope imperfections. Uh, so blocking it with a coronagraph is not sufficient. You need to use uh, a mirror that can adapt to random uh, variations in the telescope. Uh, and as long as you have a deformable mirror that can adapt to, to random imperfections of, of the telescope, uh, it turns out that it's already sufficient to remove the known diffraction of the second star, uh, thereby obviating the need for a coronagraph to a large degree to block the second star, because it's, it's sufficiently far away. So, so at the end, it's the same uh, that uh, I was on the example that I mentioned before. If you have a star that starts and 
and there is a bump, that bump will send rays where you don't want them to land. If you have another star, that other star hit the bump and it's going to send another set of rays in the wrong location. So you need to be able to control all those rays from one star and from the other star right. caused by that little bump. But the source of the error is the same, is those little bumps right. in the mirror. Last question? Uh, yes, uh, data storage on the, uh, on the 45 centimeter earth trailing option in which you download only every three months. It, it sounds like if you're really interested in the possibility of diurnal and other variations, you're going to have to store up all your frames and download all the frames, which sounds like quite a bit of, of storage. And, and sort of related to that is how confident will you be that you're not getting false positives on, on the star, on the planet itself, on the diurnal variation, and so on? So I'll answer the storage, and maybe yes. you can answer the other part. Yep. Uh, this was a topic of long discussion, because at the end, the, the frames are very small, are 100 by 100 pixels only. So each frame is 20 kilobyte. Now, the problem is we're taking every uh, one frame every 20 minutes, and we're doing a cosmic ray rejection. So we are actually taking 10 second exposure to avoid cos cosmic rays. and on board, we are deleting part of the frames and not deleting, but compressing them. Now, uh, at the end, we need a huge storage. You're right. And we are downloading only part of the data. So on the baseline mission, we're not planning to download everything. We're just going to download the frames that are going to be sharp, let's say, that are being corrected. That reduces the data volume by a factor of five. However, you want to keep everything because let's say that later somebody comes with a clever algorithm to recover data from the blur image. You want to be able to say, OK, we're going to spend a month of the mission putting the high gain antenna and download everything because we figure out a way to recover the data. So actually, you have to reach out to the largest hard drive available for space uh, qualification to be able to store the data. And uh, to some point, we won't be able to, like after a year and a half, we'll have to start to override. But our, our hope is that if by a year and a half we haven't figured out a way to use the data, it's OK to delete part of it. So which is uh, maybe by the time that we fly, there will be a larger hard drive space qualifier will be able to implement. So I, th I think the, the second part of the question, Paul, uh, which is a great question, by the way, is how do we um, avoid confusion with other you know, false positives, basically. Um, and uh, uh, one thing that really helps for, and that's uh, um, more or less a kind of unique feature of this mission, is that uh, our uh, post-processing pipeline is only sensitive to things that appear to move on Keplerian orbits around the star. So if we see something that does not move on a Keplerian orbit, even though it looks like a pale blue dot uh, or, or masquerades as a planet, uh, the pipeline will, will reject it. Uh, this is exactly how we are able to achieve the post-processing uh, deep contrast improvement factor that, that we can. So uh, another uh, way that we can uh, eliminate false positives is uh, by, uh, by, by looking at colors. And this is specifically to differentiate uh, exosodiacal dust around the star, which is likely to be gray in color. But uh, planets, uh, I mean, th th they can be gray, but uh, th th we expect a diversity of colors in planets. So if we see a colored dot, it's very unlikely to be uh, exosodiacal false positive. Thank you. I thank the speakers again.